Welcome to ARC 207, where we want to have a look at why modern cloud apps are so awesome, but also looking to answer the questions whether using or building modern cloud apps makes it harder to make a switch if you ever should have to. So my name is Gregor. During the day, my job is to be an enterprise strategist, and that means I work with our strategic customers on their overall cloud journey and their IT transformation. And at night, I spent most of my time building applications and, you know, quite honestly, playing around with our serverless products, particularly serverless integration. I have a long history in integration and building asynchronous systems, so I find that to be an excellent way of building applications. Now, having this kind of double life leads to some interesting insights. On one hand, I get to have conversations at very different levels of the organization, and you can understand how different layers have different kind of concerns, but you can also sometimes see how decision makers can be disconnected from some of the things in the engine room, and that can lead to suboptimal decisions. So making a connection between high-level strategies like managing locking and managing switching cost and building modern serverless cloud applications is actually something highly valuable. So I want to start with a tiny bit of definition, what I mean when I say modern cloud apps. There's sort of a, a chart that we commonly show, and that goes a little bit like this. It's sort of, you know, the more to the right, the cooler you are, the more modern you are. You start with VMs, then you put things in container, and if you're sort of serverless, right, then you sort of reach the pinnacle of modernity. And that's good, but I would say that's only a small part of the picture. Because if I look at the application, I don't look at just like, where does it run? I also want to see, are you doing everything by hand, or do you have it automated? Do you uh, use CI, CD, continuous integration, or is this all like duct, ta duct tape and string wire? What about observability? Are you using managed services, right? Or are you hand coding everything and then just put it in Lambda and say, oh, now I'm very modern? I don't think so, right? You should be using modern services. And if you build something fine-grained, you should pay a lot of attention to managing such a system and having sufficient observability. And the list of questions goes on, right? Maybe you're building a serverless monolith, right? Does that put you on the far right? Maybe, maybe not. Maybe this is written in COBOL, right? Does that qualify, right? Maybe not a bad language, but harder to be pressed to say that you're having a modern application. So when I say modern applications, I really mean the sum of languages, architectures, ways of working, being in the cloud, using automation, using managed services, the sum of all these things, not just the runtime. And if we understand this, then it also totally makes sense that when we say serverless at AWS, we don't mean just Lambda and Fargate, right? Werner in this morning's keynote talked a lot about asynchrony and event-driven architectures and event bridge and step functions and SQS and SNS, right? And DynamoDB, these are all parts of the serverless suite. So for us, serverless is not just a runtime. It's a way of building applications. We saw the announcement of the composer this morning also, right? That all comes together when we say modern applications and when we say serverless. So yesterday I gave a talk that was titled The Architect Elevator. It's a book I wrote, and it's about architects connecting different levels of the organization. And one of the statements that I like to make is that as architects, we tend to be the people who see more dimensions. Some folks feel things are sort of one way or the other, and we can show them that there are more dimensions to this discussion. And I want to apply that way of thinking to this question. If I move further on the right, on, uh, to the right on my curve, right, I gain a lot of things, but do I lose something? Right? Do I lose flexibility? And the trigger for this, the kind of conversations that I have, they sound a little bit like this. I understand that building applications on a serverless ecosystem, that's sort of the cloud-native way of doing things, right? That's the way you build applications. The cloud wanted you to build applications. Right? You're fine-grained, event-driven, fully automated, programmable in CDK, using managed services, asynchronous, like all these kind of things. That's what you want. 
but at the same time, you also want freedom, right? What if you need to make a change? Your application, when I talked about evolvability and evolvable architectures, well, things can evolve in many different ways. What if they ever need to evolve in? You need to do this on a different platform. And the one-dimensional view looks roughly like this. Right? On the left-hand side are sort of the old ways of working. That's what you don't like. Those are the brittle monoliths, lack of automation. Everything is self-coded. You don't get to use managed services as much. Right? Those are all the things you don't like. That's why you do want to build modern applications. But then there is perceived thing at the bottom where it says, well, isn't that what locks me in? And the sad answer is, as long as you have a one-dimensional view on this, there's no happy place. Right? It's like either you're there or you're here or you're somewhere in the middle and you're probably unhappy in both regards. So that's not good. So as architects, we can come in and say, why does this have to be on a single dimension? Why is there only left and right and why is there only red or green? Why can't I have more dimensions? So I can say, let's plot this on a chart. Here's how much platform usage I have and here much is sort of this you know, much dreaded word of Lock in it. If I take the single dimensional view, right, this is a straight line, right? So I've taken the old way of thinking, but I put it in a new model. As architects, we like to use models to sharpen our thinking. So this model has two dimensions. And now I can have different discussions, right? Is this really linear? Or maybe I can dampen the curve, right? Maybe I have some switching costs, and we realize we always have switching costs, but maybe that doesn't actually go up that much, right? And you have that discussion, and you can have a whole other level of discussion, which is maybe there's another dimension in this, right? Maybe there's the X factor, or maybe we call it Z, Z factor, right? What if I can shift this thing into a whole parallel universe, and that actually allows me to drive these so-called lock-in, these kind of switching costs down? So using these kind of architecture models fundamentally changes your way of looking at the problem and allows you to think about it much differently. But let me tackle the notion of lock-in a little bit. It's always, you know, seems to be like we go into jail or something, right? When we talk about lock-in, it's a bit of an odd term, you know? In the end, there's two key statements we need to make. The one is, this isn't sort of a binary thing. It's like, you got locked in. It's like Monopoly, you go to jail or something, right? It's like, no, it has many dimensions and many gradations, right? There is vendor lock-in. It might be hard to switch from one vendor to another, but there's also product and version lock-in. I know organizations who spend a lot of money just upgrading from one version of a commercial product to another version. Um, architecture switching costs. Even if you build the application yourself, like you control everything you made it, it will not be free to change the architecture of this application. So the second part we see is the word lock-in is you know, somewhat misleading. We're really talking about switching cost. How much does it cost me to go from A to B? And that'll never be free, right? As I said, it's not even free if you do it yourself, right? You will also have a cost. If you have a commercial software product, you will have a cost. Now, of course, you get benefit in return for using these things. So architects are in the business of trade-off. So the discussion you should be having, am I getting more than I'm potentially paying? Now, this maneuver of seeing more dimensions and seeing more gradations here leads to some quite interesting insights. The one insight is open source is great, but open source doesn't magically make switching costs go away. It reduces vendor-related switching costs, but for example, it doesn't reduce version or product or architecture switching costs. Right? These are still there, and I said, even if you write it yourself, you will still have those. I'm a big fan of open source, but I'm always a little bit critical when we say the main benefit of open source is portability. I find the main benefit of open source is that everybody can contribute, and we have transparency and create things together. We have a community. I much rather like those aspects. And the other one, there was one at the bottom I didn't comment on. There's a notion of mental lock-in. And you kind of wonder what that is. You might reach for your aluminum foil and make a, make a foil hat so you don't get mentally locked in. I'll come back to that later. Why that's actually a serious topic and how you can manage the mental lock-in. 
So let's look at what people normally do when they talk about switching costs. Let's say I built something, I built modern cloud apps, and I want to know what does it look like if I needed to take that to another platform. And so the first tool that you will generally find are the so-called service mappings. You know, several cloud providers will have these mappings and they look a little bit like this, right? On your favorite cloud, you have certain things. You have Lambdas, you have your SQS, right? You have you know, DynamoDB, you have EC2, and then in the other world, there's something that's called roughly similar and looks relatively similar, right? And if you zoom out far enough, you can say, well, they probably kind of correspond one to one. And actually, for architects, this zooming out is a useful but also a dangerous maneuver because some abstraction is good, but Joel Spolsky once coined the term of the astronaut architects, and basically he said, if you zoom out too far, you get into thin air, you lose oxygen, and you lose your judgment. Right? If you zoom out far enough, everything will suddenly look the same. So be careful here. Right? If the boxes become smaller and smaller, you might be on, in thin air up there and not having your sharpest judgment. And one easy way to illustrate this is, right, you guys know AWS has a large variety of different databases, right? There's document databases and graph databases, Neptune, and there's TimeStream. You know, the series goes on. Now, what are the odds that another vendor was going to slice the database universe exactly the same way? Right? What are the odds that this matches one to one? In one hand, I would say just statistically it's low, but also I say it's good in a way that different vendors slice different ways. You don't want the clouds to be absolute carbon copies of each other. You want that kind of diversity. You want that kind of choice. At least I do. Right? Sometimes people say, oh, it's all the same. It's all commodities. Like, totally it's not. And it's good that way because it gives you choice, right? If you like our way of, you know, the way the databases are set up, you will be very happy. If you don't like that, right, maybe you might be more happy somewhere else. I can totally live with that, and I find it good that you have that kind of choice. So the odds that these things are sliced equally are low. And this is one of the reasons you will find AWS does not publish a service mapping. We do not have, I, at least to the extent that I could find, I could not find a table that says AWS service here corresponds to service over there because we know that gives you a little bit of an illusion. And if you want to sort of drill down a little bit more, one of the services I work a lot with is EventBridge. We heard a lot about EventBridge this morning. I was very happy. Great things coming along with pipes. But let's just look at the documents for EventBridge. If you guys haven't used EventBridge, it's a relatively self-contained, I don't want to say simple because it might sort of make it sound less important than it is, but it's a very well-defined self-contained services that is an event broker. Event comes in, you can filter, you can root, transform, right? You, and then republish the event. You can do with event schemas. So very, very nice and self-contained. But if you go and look at the docs, here's the list of features. No worry, I'm not going to read them out, right? I actually had to chop a few at the bottom, right? Even this, you know, if you look at the giant tapestry of AWS services, you know, probably event bridges in some little corner of them somewhere, right? It's a part of the overall, overall service portfolio we have, but you can see how much depth is in a single, relatively self-contained service. And we're not talking about all the other things that are part of the platform, like the IAM integration, right, the CloudWatch integration, all these kind of things. So again, the odds that this matches exactly somewhere else are just low. So what we learn is that service mappings don't really work very well. There's sort of a bit of an illusion, might give people some comfort level, but in reality, right, the services don't map that one-to-one. -one. So if you you know, you're on the left-hand side and you build something with our wonderful serverless services, right? And you think, ah, I just use that map and go over there. That is unlikely to work. Well, we always get a little bit smart and we say, okay, if that's not that easy, let's not actually use these services down there. Let's make an abstraction layer, right? And as computer scientists, we have some proven success to the point where there's sort of the universal, I think it's called a fundamental theorem, it's called a software engineering of you can solve every problem by just one more layer of indirection. There's a footnote and that says, except if you have too many layers of indirection. 
something happens. So let's do that, right? And this does work in many circumstances, right? We do this all the time. Here's an example that where this works really well. So let's say you have many development teams and you want to give teams the choice of programming language, right? You might some folks who have sort of, you know, probably get in trouble if I say more traditional programming languages on the left, right? And sort of more modern ones on the right, sort of whichever way you want to look at it, right? And we know that putting layers on top, building APIs and common communications protocols around this, right? You can make the layer and you can make that difference essentially go away. So this level of indirection, you know, you don't talk to the TypeScript code over there from your Python code over here. You have this layer and that works pretty well. We use this all the time. Now, I call this making options, right? I had a talk yesterday where I say architects sell options. It's basically by putting this common layer in, I give you the option to choose your programming language freely. Interestingly, in order to give you that options, I also took some other options away. Everybody has to use the same API layer. So it's like a trading place. You harmonize some things and you gain flexibility in others. Very interesting architecture maneuver. And the reason I call this options and the reason I call this selling options, selling implies something isn't free, right? Selling implies that it has a cost. So these options also have a cost. These layers don't come for free, right? In this example that we have here, you need to do some work to build this, right? Somebody needs to make the API layers, maybe use some libraries, right? And Always remember, when your engineers do something that isn't building functionality, you're not paying in their salary cost. You're paying in their opportunity cost, right? The day they spend this, this famous saying, right? They say, oh, I can do this over the weekend, which really means it'll take me a week, right? And if it takes a week, it's not like five times a thousand dollars day rate, but it should be a high multiple of that because in that week, the engineers could have created business value. Many years ago, when I worked in Silicon Valley, the number that we used, it was sort of a napkin number, I never had a proof for it, the number that we used was that one engineer hour is worth 2,000 US dollars. That was the opportunity cost. That's how much business value we could generate. It's also hinted, make your engineers very productive, because that way the opportunity cost goes up, and that's actually a good thing. That's how your business functions. Right? The opportunity cost, the value creator has got to be a high multiple of the money you pay. Otherwise, you cannot have a running business. So building these things isn't cheap. You know, there might have some of complexity, APIs, retries, failures, um, interface changes, contract changes, right? Like stuff yesterday, I also had a talk about distributed systems, so all these kind of things of um, state management, ultimate consistency, you know, retries, item potency, all these kind of things will, will hit you here. And the last cost you have is you have some amount of underutilization. And that is true in this API example also. For example, your programming language might have very nice object-oriented constructs. You know, it, has, it has inheritance, it has method overriding, right? It has constructs, it might have special data types that you can use, but your APIs cannot have those because not all the other languages might support it or support it in the same way. So the APIs are usually not object-oriented, and they often have fewer data types. Right? So you use protocol buffers, that is great, but you will have fewer data types than you would otherwise have. So classic architecture decision, right? you can put the layer in, you gain some flexibility in abstraction, but you also have a cost against that. Right? In this context, I often say be careful, having these options, having this flexibility is useful, but if you want options for everything, you're gonna drown in complexity, right? If you want something that runs in any language, on any platform, in any environment, on any UI, in any location, I always say either you build a JVM, because you sort of built the most generic thing that could possibly do anything that you would ever want, and that doesn't have a lot of value, or you're likely to drown in complexity because everything has now become flexible and you have a giant complicated system. So successful organizations manage this well. They're able to make some decisions, lock some things down, right, and gain others, and that way they stay out of the complexity trap. 
Now, I mentioned that architects like models. Right? So on this spectrum, and I come back to this options notion a little bit, I come out of financial services, so I like this model, and how do you decide? Right? If you put this layer in, it has some benefits, it has a cost. So how do I decide? What do I gain from putting this layer in? Well, from, I gain that a potential switching cost, so let's say I put a layer on top of my cloud, right? A lot of open source projects out there that are doing that or looking to do that, right? What am I doing moving to the right? I reduce my potential switching cost, right? And that total cost is the likelihood that I need to switch multiplied by how much it would cost me to switch. Right? So if you say, if I ever needed to go to another platform, that would cost me $100,000, and the chance that this will happen in the next couple of years is 5%, your liability is $5,000, right? It's the amount that you would pay times the likelihood that you have. And of course, the lower this is, the better, right? You gain, right? If this is less, that is absolutely valuable. No discussion about it. Now the question is, how do you get this lower? And we just said, you know, these layers that you put in to reduce your switching costs, they have a cost today, right? They are not free. And now, rather than having these dogmatic discussions about, oh, does everything have to be on Kubernetes? Can everything be native? Is Kubernetes also serverless, right? You can have all these kind of debates. Now you can have a much better decision model, right? How much upfront invest can I justify in order to reduce the future switching costs. And you can make assumptions. How much would it cost me if I do nothing? What's the likelihood? Is some low-hanging fruit, right? And I can have sort of something in the middle. And folks in the financial services industry, they know this all very well. They have formulas for this kind of stuff. They call this the option price and the strike price. The option price is what you pay right now in order to have the option later. And the strike price is the money you still pay when you utilize the option, right? Because even with all the layers, that isn't gonna be zero. And interestingly, making the strike price zero is also not the exercise here, because then technically it's no longer an option because you made all the investment already upfront. So the goal isn't to make the switching cost zero, the goal is to find the optimum between upfront invest and having a good read on potential switching cost. And having models like this allows you to make much sharper decisions around this. For example, in financial services, time value of money. Probably learned that somewhere everybody came across this in school, right? Today's dollar is worth more than tomorrow's dollar. That's why the lottery pays you over 30 years. They don't pay you today, they pay you over 30 years, and the real amount of money you get in today's dollars is about a third, right? That's called the time value of money. So one thing, once you have this model, you need to factor in is the investment you make today, like the option price you pay, like building these layers, using these layers, the extra complexity, the underutilization, you pay for that in today's dollars, right? That is cost that you have right now. If the complexity slows you down in any way, that is a cost you have right now. If you have engineer hours building this, that cost you have right now. The payoff is in the future. So the payoff, like the reduction in potential liability, might happen one or two or three years down the road. So you're paying with more expensive dollars than you're gaining back, and you can factor this in. Now the question you should have, now what's the interest rate in this thing, right? We live in interesting times with inflations and low interest rate and high interest rates. You're like, so, so, so how much less is next year's dollars worth? It seems this year that's somehow a lot, right? And it bothers all of us, right? But how do, you, how do you put this in this kind of equation? And the answer is, is the rate of return of your organization. The faster moving you are, the higher this discount rate is. And that leads to a very interesting insight why fast-moving organizations very rarely use or build these abstraction layers. Because to them, today's dollars, in comparison to the future dollars, are extremely expensive. If they were going to spend six months or 12 months doing some of this, they will be out of business. The cost will have been infinite, and they actually never get to use the option. So the faster moving an organization is, the less valuable this exercise of reducing switching costs becomes. 
Now, interestingly, I mostly have the discussion about these abstraction layers and trying to get the portability costs down with traditional organizations. In one hand, you could say, aha, if they're slower moving, right, that is a better discussion for them to have, right, because for them, maybe the future dollars aren't worth that much less than today's dollars. But that is sort of the wrong argument. The reason we have this discussion with more traditional organizations is they want to become like the modern organizations, right? They want to move faster. So I'm like, that's the lever you should pull. You should become a faster moving organization and with that way realize that the future dollars are not nearly as valuable to you. That's where you want to go, not start building a lot of stuff based on where you come from. It's the famous go where the puck, head where the puck is going. You want to be like a fast moving company, you got to think like a fast moving company. Now, people say like, okay, I get your intellectual argument, but haven't we done this in other cases very successfully? And I said, APIs, right? That definitely works. But another one is SQL for databases, right? Don't we need something like SQL for the cloud? Because SQL, right, pretty much you know, any relational database, right, supports SQL. So there is our layer. And I don't have all this complexity and all the stuff you talked about. It sort of just comes for free, right? Why can't we have something like this for the cloud? Well, good question, but we need to look at the history of SQL. SQL wasn't developed as a portability language. It was built by a single company, IBM at the time, right? And it was designed as a productivity tool, right? It was designed to make it easier to work with relational databases, and it sits on top of a very solid theory, like relational, relational algebra, like at Cot, I think, right? The guys who developed this in the 60s, right? There's a foundation for this language. It wasn't just somebody came along and said, oh, I think all databases should sort of use the same syntax, right? This came out of a research project to make it easier to work with these kind of databases. And then later, Oracle said, oh, that's kind of neat, and they ended up using this. But it comes out of a very different context. And also, to give you a feeling for how difficult it is to do this is, they used to publish the SQL spec in a single volume, and they stopped doing that because it hit almost 600 pages. Interestingly, they also sell them by volume, so now they charge you like six or seven times to buy all the different parts. So as it goes, but it shows that you're saying like, hey, just dealing with a database, I don't want to trivialize it, right? It's a little bit more than reading and writing data, but it's sort of one part of this whole universe. You have a 600-page spec, and you have vendor extensions, and the language also doesn't deal with performance and optimization with all the runtime characteristics. So yes, SQL is nice, but it comes out of a different direction, and it wasn't made to solve this kind of problem. It was meant as a productivity tool. Because the problem is if you have existing platforms and you were trying to, trying to put a layer on top, the two services aren't exactly going to match. Right? Maybe a service over here has more things in the area A and fewer features in area B, and the competitor has it the other way around. And then you're faced with two both equally unattractive options. Right? The one option would be, well, let me fill in the gaps. That's a pretty thankless exercise. We're just at reInvent, and a number of announcements you've seen, right? These capabilities will grow. So either you wasted time by building something that then the provider adds, or you're constantly playing catch up. Not very good to sort of try to compete with multiple very successful cloud providers, right? Highly innovative companies, fast moving target, right? You would be signing up for a lot to sort of try to fill in the gaps even if you technically could, right? Some of the features might be deep down in the code, so then it's not even doable uh, or not even conceivable to, to do this. And the other one is, of course, well, I don't use those features that don't match, but that is your classic underutilization problem, right? You're in the cloud to gain velocity and use managed services, so not using managed services and reducing your velocity isn't exactly the best idea. Right? And even from a functional perspective, if this was going to work, you have all the other runtime characteristics. What if those two services have different pricing models, different scaling mechanisms, different performance, right? There is nothing you can build in your API layer that absorbs those kind of changes, right? So that's why, you know, for you applications, making API layers works well. In the cloud, across the whole universe, that doesn't work nearly as well. And that's why... 
I often like to remind folks, there's a lot of open source projects I, I like, especially also in the distri distributed system arena, but I'm always a little bit skeptical if they pitch as their main benefit, this reduces lock-in, right? This is a little bit sort of, yeah, I, I tend to say this is sort of for the afterlife, right? You know, if you use this framework, life might be a little bit harder, but you know, sort of somewhere in the distant future, you gain something. In a fast moving and competitive environment, that is a tough sell. Like if you have a framework, the framework's gotta make your life easier right now, not at some point in an undetermined future. This is even worse in large organizations, quite honestly, I see it, where internal teams build these giant frameworks and they kind of feel they can get away with it because they feel they can force the other folks to use it, right? And it doesn't actually make their life any easier and this never has a happy end, right? Either you make everybody's life miserable, that wasn't a great success, or people will work around it and then you wasted all this kind of effort. So you gotta have a value proposition today, not for a potential faraway case, right? Remember SQL, SQL value prop was, it makes it much easier to deal with relational databases right now, and that's why it originally became successful, and that's why it became widely adopted. It wasn't sort of a promise for the future, it was something that delivered value today. So if you're looking to build any of these kind of things, it's gotta make developer's life easier. It's got to increase their velocity, reduce maybe the number of mistakes they make, get them started more quickly, right? There's many ways you can do that, but it's got to have a positive impact. Nobody's going to be willing to suffer today, right, for some potential payoff. So what we see is the idea of abstraction layers is around, but sort of making them bottom up by saying, oh, let me see what this cloud does and let me see what this cloud does and sort of put a common thing in doesn't work extremely well. You cannot absorb the runtime differences and you're going to end up with the lowest common denominator problem. You're going to end up with underutilization and that is very much not a good thing. Let's think back about the picture, the X factor, right? The new dimension that we put in. How about if there's something very different that we can do to reduce switching costs without giving up all the cool things that we want? And I think we have one, and that is called velocity, the speed at which you work. Because I come back to my statement, portability is important, but only if you're successful. Right? If you're slower today, and you don't build anything that's successful in the market, you'll never have to port. So don't compromise today's success for future's promise. Right? So if you want to have success today, you gain velocity. Right. How do you gain velocity? Well, this is things we know relatively well, right? You take friction out of your software delivery cycle, reduce your software inventory. Right? People always forget that software has inventory. Right? We always think about inventory sort of manufacturers like cars sitting, sitting on the lot. Any line of code that you write that is not in production is inventory. Right? That slows you down and costs you money. It's cost that's incurred that hasn't delivered any value. Any branch right, in Git is inventory. Right? I worked in a large organization once. We had a big, big system, very nice system, but the release cycle was slow. It was a six-month release cycle. Right? If you do some simple math, you're saying, okay, let's say that's 100 working days to make it easy. There's 100 developers on this project, and they cost me $1,000 a day. That's 10 million bucks. Right? It's $10 million that you paid that you have gotten nothing back for. That is not high velocity. And this is one of the reasons we like to reduce release cycles and increase cadence. It's not because it's cool, it is real money in the bank because you get the value back sooner after you make your investment. And of course, the best way to get velocity is to not build things that have low or no value. Well, the catch is, of course, how do you know that? Well, you do know that by making smaller iterations and focusing on things that have delivered the value and you further improve them. And we know these things all very well, right? They are common vocabulary, right? DevOps takes the friction out through automation, you know, CI, CD. Then, of course, you have lean methods that help you think about the inventory and get the inventory out of the system. And then, of course, the agile methods are there that you don't know everything up front, but that you need to see what actually has value and do more of what has value and do less of what doesn't have value. Now, the amazing thing is that if you manage to increase your development velocity, you also reduce your switching cost. 
You know, the lock-in, the so-called lock-in, isn't something the vendor does to you. It's not like, so we did something and somehow you're locked in. Your own velocity is the biggest determinant of a possible switching cost. And I have a couple of, of examples and anecdotes of this. So some years ago, JDK 1.6 was deprecated and longer, longer maintained. So I worked in a very large organization where this led to months and months of steering committee meetings and probably like double digit million dollar efforts to go get rid of 1.6 everywhere and upgrade to the next version of the, version of the JDK. You will find other organizations who didn't even notice because they do the version upgrades all the time. They have automated testing. For them, it's kind of a non-event. They did it somewhere you know, some months ago, and nobody even paid attention. Now, was this you know, Sun or Oracle locking them in? No, right? This is a difference in velocity. Some organizations dealt with that change well because they set up for change, and the other organization wasn't set up for change, so the switching cost is a function of their velocity, not a function of the product design. There's nothing wrong with JDK, well, at least not in that regard, right? It's like there's nothing in JDK that is designed to make it difficult for you to upgrade the version. That comes out of the velocity. So that is one of the biggest levers. That is the X factor that you have. And it has another really nice property. Higher velocity helps you today. It helps you release a successful product faster. And it also reduces your switching costs. So you don't have this, I need to suffer today for some payoff in the future. You gain now and you gain in the future. It's a very different way of thinking at this. Right, I have a colleague who used to work for a startup. They had everything in serverless, and they actually migrated that to AWS, and it took them two weeks. And he said the interesting thing is all the problems they had are problems that the abstraction layers would not have gotten for them because it's all sort of operational considerations and cost optimization. Right? But they did it in two weeks because they ran a high-velocity organization. So that's the biggest lever you have to reduce your switching cost and benefit from modern cloud applications. And there's a second lever, and if we're coming back to the aluminum foil hats and the mental lock-in here. And that is that when you design systems, you often go too close to the platform. Right? And I said this in my talk yesterday, and this is coming for somebody who works for AWS. If you only think in the services, you've become mentally locked in. We love the services, they're all fantastic, right? We're launching more of them, right? That is all good. But your thinking shouldn't be just in the services. Like your architecture isn't step functions and event bridge, right? Your architecture should be something that you have in mind. Right? Let's stay with event bridge again. I said it's my favorite sort of example service, right? Why are you using event bridge? So it's a relatively self-contained service, but it can do many different things for you. Maybe you are looking to filter messages, right? There's various kinds of messages coming in, and only some kinds of messages should go through. You know, I wrote a book 19 years ago called Enterprise Integration Patterns, so we actually have a name for that. That is called a message filter. Or maybe you know, different messages go different places. That is called a content-based router. Or you're transforming, you're changing the format of the message. You're taking some fields out and you combine others. That's called a message translator. And EventBridge can also have multiple targets per rule, so you can also build something like a recipient list, right? Send this event to the following three or four destinations. So these are very different things. So your architecture is on the right, it's the intent. This is what I intended to do. I wanted to filter messages. I used EventBridge to do that, and possibly I might have used Lambda to do that. If I need a very complex condition that combines multiple fields, right, I may not be able to do that in EventBridge, so I use EventBridge if I can, because the fully managed service always wins, but if I cannot, I might have done the same thing writing a Lambda function. But if I, all I say is, oh, I use EventBridge, all this knowledge is actually lost. And that's sort of sometimes a little bit my criticism when we draw architecture pictures. You know, they only contain the service icons. 
You know, I can't blame us too much. We love our services and our icons, right, as we should. But I always find these diagrams to be not as expressive as they could be because a big part of this intent is lost. So this is what's mental lock-in. If you only ever describe your solutions using the service vocabulary, it becomes harder for you to think and retain the intent of what you try to build. And as you can easily imagine, that makes it also harder to take it somewhere else. Because you would now have to reverse engineer, right? You go to the service map and you say, what does EventBridge look like over there? And you find something, right? But maybe that something does message transformation, but it doesn't do the recipient list. Right? And now you're like, oh, that didn't work. Right? You get stuck very easily. Versus if you remember what you were after, then you can make a much better decision. Now, I'm a little bit biased. I have a long history in patterns. So I want to show a little bit why I find that that step in your design process is so important. Yes, common pattern we use, we call it scatter gather. You send messages to multiple recipients, they send the results back and you re-aggregate the results. Very, very, very common. Werner talked about patterns this morning. Very classic integration patterns, straight out of the enterprise integration patterns book from 19 years ago. Right? You want to get the best offer for something, you broadcast it, you, you know, pick the best, the best result. Well, we use this all the time. There are some design decisions to be made, right? We as architects, we should look at the design of this. And here are some of the design decisions that you need to make. Do you know the number of recipients, right? Or is that sort of arbitrary? Um, who decides when a recipient can be added or taken away? Is that somewhat static or is that very dynamic? Important design decision might impact your choices. Um, how do the recipients respond? Do all of them respond or can they abstain? Also important, right? Because if you send it to five but some can abstain and you wait for five responses, that obviously will not work. So you need to know when are you done. If you know the number of recipients and they're required to respond, then it's easy, you wait for all. But if you don't know the number, you need to do something else, right? You need to either time out or wait for a certain number or you have a quality bar where you say, if I get a really good response, I stop waiting for the others, right? Well-known strategies that come with it. And of course, I don't even think I have it on here. You need a correlation identifier. You need to even know that the responses actually belong together, that you also need to decide. So quite a few things to do here. And then, yeah, even when you know you're done, you still need to combine the answers, right? Do you take the best answer? Do you concatenate them? Do you add them all up, right? It's sort of... A little bit like a map reduce step, like at the end, reduce it to a single data set. So quite a lot of stuff to decide. Now, the amazing thing here is that none of this has anything to do with the service selection. Right? This is distributed system design. These are important design decisions that you ought to make. And the mistake that I see people often make is that they substitute the service selection for this rigor of thinking. They're like, oh, I used EventBridge. Right? And they're like, oh, that was my architecture decision. It's like, no, no, the architecture decisions are exactly those. So skipping this layer is actually quite dangerous in my point of view. Right? And also leads to the mental lock-in, right? Because this is something that has nothing to do with services, and it has another huge advantage. You can communicate this to a much broader audience. Go to a business user and say, come have a look at my EventBridge configuration in CDK code here. They're going to like, ah, later, dude, right? It's like, you know, leave, me, leave me alone, right? It's going to be very hard. But you can have these conversations with a business user. Are our recipients required to respond, right? When do we know we're done? Can we take best, uh, first best answer? Or can we, like, this kind of conversations you can have with a business audience. So maintaining this level is highly valuable, both for your software design and also to reduce your switching costs because you have a much, much better starting point. Right? So use those patterns. Don't skip that very important step. Like after the requirement doesn't come the service, after the requirement comes the design of your system and the core design decisions that you make. And ultimately, you can find those somewhere in the services, but reverse engineering them out is going to be very hard. So capture those and maintain those design intent. 
And when you do that, I you know, poked a tiny bit of fun at the pictures with the icons, right? What I like to do is I like icons that express intent and then decorate it with the services that you use. Of course, it's important to choose the right services, but this also shows the intent. There's a pub sub channel, there's a filtering of messages, right? There's an aggregation at the end that explains to you what you're looking to achieve here. And the nice thing about this is that you now describe your solution in three different languages. You have the business language, so this is, I call this, my favorite example I always use is like a loan broker. Somebody wants to get a loan, you talk to some banks to get the, get the best quote, and then you deliver the best quote back to the customer, right? You have obviously the language of the business domain, right? You talk about banks and quotes and mortgage brokers, right? That's the language of the business domain. And you have the language of AWS serverless solutions, right? You have SQS and SNS and DynamoDB to build the aggregator, right? Lambda to run the functions, right? That vocabulary you also have, but you have an important vocabulary in the middle, and that is the vocabulary of building distributed systems. That's the vocabulary of pub subchannels, of message filter, content filters, aggregators, translators, resequencers, right? The 65 of them in the book. And separating those is very useful to you right now and in a possible switching scenario. Now, the cloud has done some pretty amazing things. And I would say one of the most amazing things the cloud has done is automation. I sometimes go as far as say cloud without automation is probably more or less a better data center. Right? Automation is a fundamental aspect of why the cloud is so useful, and it's an inherent aspect of building modern cloud applications. Right? You couldn't imagine having a fine-grained serverless application and like, do everything by hand. Automation is fundamental. And that allows us to do something pretty magical. So these design patterns I showed, right? In the book we wrote 19 years ago, the enterprise integration patterns, they were largely on paper, right? They were like design constructs, right? There wasn't like an aggregator. It was like something that would help you express your intent, but there wasn't sort of a matching runtime element for that. But with automation and in the cloud, you can change that. You can code these patterns. And here's an example. It's actually a real example where I said, I need some data that's coming in, and I need to combine the data. Very typical pattern in event-driven architectures, right? There's some events. I correlate these events, right? They all have the same ID, one, two, three. I combine them, and I concatenate the values, right? And I, I, I build that. It's very common. And you can build this very nicely with DynamoDB, because DynamoDB has some really cool operations, atomic operations like list append. Very, very neat. Right? Every time I dig deeper into our services, I find some really cool stuff. It's like, hey, whoever put this in really thought ahead, because in a distributed system, right, that is one of the key you know, challenges. How do I avoid contention? if I need to append to a list or increment a counter, and voila, DynamoDB has built-in functions for both. Makes your life much, much easier. Now I went to build this in another cloud. I actually built this. I kind of pseudo-coded the code a little bit to make it not too easy to, to figure out where this was, and it didn't have that feature. I'm like, okay, you know, no harm done. I do the classic thing that you would do with a database. You, know, you would you know, basically open a transaction, lock the record, you know, append to the record, and, and write it back, put it back in the database. Yeah, not so bad. I can get the same thing done. But there was a catch. That database is highly scalable, but not on the same entity. It has a very low limit on updates for the same entity, to, to the point where my demo app failed the transaction. It says too high contention. It was like one a second or something. So it actually failed. I'm like, okay, I can deal with that. So I do retries, right? So that I retry this transaction. But the retry is actually a feature of the message queue that gets these messages in. I'm like, okay, so I go to the message queue. I set the retry. Of course, you know, everybody knows what happens next. I have a bug in my function, and I have infinite retries. Well, you know, that's how retries tend to go. So be careful, you need time to live. Don't retry infinitely. So I needed to add code to do that. So I got my work done, 
But it's not a one-to-one -one mapping, right? In the one example, this is all in DynamoDB. In the other example, I'm coding all over basically message queues, and I have some of it in my, in my serverless function. I have some of it in my database. The mapping is the, the, basically my concerns, right? The, the things I need to do, they get done in different places. And that comes back why the service mapping doesn't work this well, and this makes a possible port a little bit messy. So maybe, you know, a smart person came and said, like, ah, you could have used composite keys to avoid this contention. So, you know, might have been able to do that. But in any case, it made a good example. So how can patterns help me there? I should realize that what I'm doing is not some, you know, random list append in DynamoDB, but that I'm building an aggregator. I should package this problem together in one piece of code. Because I might have this need in many different places in my application. And if I build an abstraction, I say this is an aggregator. It's one of the patterns out of enterprise integration patterns. Then I can code a class like this. It's a little bit pseudo-coded, right? But in an ideal world, I could code something out where I say, right, here's the, uh, the aggregator. It correlates by this field. It gets the payload, payload out of this branch of the document. Here's the completeness condition, right? I need at least two answers, and I'm going to time out after 10 seconds maybe, and then I concatenate the answers, right? This is all totally doable. And then I can absorb all the differences underneath, right? As I said, with DynamoDB, I didn't need to do, deal with retries and time to lives, and also I can give limited lifetime to my aggregates, right? So I don't want to retain them forever. So DynamoDB does that all for me. And in the other case, it maps to different kind of resources, right? So the, the time to live and the retry was actually on the, on the queue, for example. But coding this as a pattern absorbs the differences in one place, and it makes it much easier to move this somewhere else if you need to, because you're starting with higher level abstractions. You're not saying I have a random mix of sort of lambdas and SQS and DynamoDB and nobody knows exactly what it actually does. In this case, you know exactly what it does. You aggregate multiple events and you can build an equivalent solution on another cloud and the rest of your application pretty much doesn't have to change. You isolated the change. And that's a classic good architecture maneuver. Reducing change propagation makes it easier to deal with your system, makes it also easier to test your system, but also makes it easier to port your systems. Right? And as I said, this used to be that these patterns were more like on paper and you know, like, you know, constructs that you would use, but now the cloud is programmable, so these kind of things you can do in automation. Right? And I actually done this. I didn't use the aggregator here because it's a bit more involved, but I used some very simple fat, uh, patterns like a content filter and a message filter. Message filter means look at the message and pass it on only if it meets certain criteria. And content filter means look at the content of the message, but don't pass all the content on, only give me a subset because I'm not interested in all the other kind of things. And here we coded these patterns out. We coded them out in CDK. And remember the three languages, right? The top part is the middle language. It speaks the language of message filter dot field exists. Only pass the message on if it has a bank ID in it, for example. Otherwise, I'm not interested. If something empty comes, I just will not use that kind of message. And it has the language of a content filter and say, give me only the payload, omit the whole event envelope that he might have, and only give me the payload. So you have the language, the middle language between the domain and the services you have as a programming language, and the implementation is in CDK. Right? Underneath is, again, my favorite service, EventBridge, that does the message filtering and the content filtering, but my automation script has a layer of abstraction. You know, it talks in content filter and message filter, and I could swap out the implementation underneath without changing my abstraction very much or at all. So, I'm a big fan of CDK in the combination with uh, serverless, so that allows you to program these kind of abstractions so the patterns are no longer just on paper. The patterns are now pieces of code that you write.
So coming back to our picture of the things that didn't work so well, right? The service mapping wasn't so great. The magic abstraction layers have some issues. So one great technique you can use is A, increase your velocity. Higher velocity will mean lower switching costs. That's a great lever you have. And the other lever is don't skip that important step, right? Don't skip capturing design intent. Your architecture and design isn't just your service selection. There's much more in there, and patterns can help you capture that. And if you even manage then to code these patterns out in like CDK or Pulumi, whatever is your preference, right, then you have a much, much better starting point. And the nice thing about that is that helps you today, right? This is a better way of building software, and it also reduces your switching costs, so you're getting out of this left or right, this like green or red kind of arrows we had at the very beginning. So, might be good to have short summary, right? It's like this locking term is near, nobody gets, gets locked up in jail, right? It's all about switching costs. Switching costs are always there. It's good to minimize them, but it's also good to understand what you're gaining in return, right? You can do an equation. If you want to have a fancy equation, use options theory to do that, right? What is the possible liability? How much am I willing to pay for the option? How much should the strike price be? What is the risk-free return rate, right? How much is tomorrow's dollars worth less than today's dollars? And you can have very nice and balanced discussion about finding the optimum. Then we saw sort of two approaches that are often cited, but in my experience don't work as well. The services like don't really map one to one, and that is good actually in my view, but it also means that the mapping doesn't work, and that's why we don't publish any. And sort of the bottom-up abstraction layers also don't nearly go as far as you would want them to. And then we talked about mental lock-in, right? Don't just think in services, think in higher level constructs, and the biggest levers you have is maintaining your design intent and having a higher velocity. And you can even build those patterns in CDK. Now, if you look at this, you say like, well, in some way, what you're actually telling me is, I should just do good software engineering, right? It's like, oh, have high velocity, use design patterns. So you made me sit through the whole 45 minutes here, right? And basically the answer is yes, you should use good software engineering. And I actually stand behind that answer, right? Use good software engineering techniques. They give you the repeatability. They allow you to make changes. They will give you more velocity. They will reduce your switching costs. They maintain your design intent, allow you to build better solutions and they also reduce your lock-in. It just took me a little while to convince you of that. <laughs> so obviously there's more behind it, and as I said, I actually tried this out. Now unsurprisingly, that material is not on an AWS website, so that is on my personal blog. You can have a look, right? I didn't make this up. I took a serverless solution, I used the patterns, I ported it over, right? And I described very much what I found to be different, but I also described very much how I found this to be totally doable. So I don't see any reason to be holding back and sort of punish yourself from using modern cloud applications. Use the serverless environment, use it in the way that you have good software engineering practices and it also very much reduces any concern around switching costs. So hopefully I was able to show more dimensions, thinking like an architect. I thank you for your time, and I'll stick around for some questions. Thank you.